Um, you have the option of seeing a video of the site of Clistow. If you go to YouTube and just type in Clistow, uh, my videographer, who's in the corner, uh, took a picture of the site as it looks now in October. And there's no narration or music or special effects. It's just what the site looks like. And there's still a road between the site and the lake. So it's a little bit of historical uh, a snapshot in time as to what it actually looked like. It shows the boundaries of the site, the neighborhood, uh, what's closest to it. Um, I advertise this heavily in the North Wind because North NMU is the biggest neighbor right now, plus the Presque Isle Apartments. Uh, would you be with NMU? <coughs> I'm with a couple of organizations. NMU is one of them. You're with NMU? Excellent. And you are here because? You know, that advertising really works. Uh, we have these people connected with the city commission. We have a manager reporter. We have two of my dearest friends. I'm also from Senator McBroom's office. Senator McBroom! He asked me to attend since he's on the board. You're representing Senator McBroom. Thank yes, you very much for coming here. Jake Nice. Margaret Brown. Nice to meet you. Your, your hands are really cold. Do you need, you need some chocolate? Um, I tried very hard, and I will continue to try to get people to see this, because um, I went looking for the book on Cliffstow, so that, for your wife, of course. Uh, yeah, for your wife. Yes. I went looking for the book on Cliffstow, because we had a city commissioner express concern at one meeting that there wasn't enough information. Don't have any more. Uh, there wasn't Mark, enough information. Mark, 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 Mark. No, it's okay. They're, they're okay. I, I, I've had one all the time. I feed them chocolate all the time. Yeah. I really do. Never deny so much. No, that's that's how you get to be elected. Here you go. Um, I went looking for the book on Cliff Stout. I came here. I went to the Regional Historical Center. I went everywhere I could think of in town looking for the person who wrote the book. We have books on beer. We have books on brothels. We have books on gangsters. We have books on ships. We have books on shipwrecks, on lighthouses, on people, on very important people. We have books on geography. We have books on Native Americans. Many, many books on Native Americans. Nobody's written a book on Cliff Stout. And I ended up thinking, um, somebody needs to do it. And just so you know, um, I got some feedback from somebody saying, who are you to be the person doing this? And most of you know me a little bit, but in case you don't know me, um, I'm Margaret Brum. I'm a chemical engineer from the Michigan Tech, which is uh, a, a place that turns out engineers that go into industry. We don't usually um, go into grad school as much as we just go straight from school right into industry. And there, that qualified me on the technical part, on the documents part, the paperwork part, I'm a patent attorney by training, that my table is always full of documents. Mm -hmm. And what was missing from the Cliffs Dow briefings that I saw in various areas was some context that what we're trying to do now with this valuable piece of property is develop it without understanding where it started, where it came from, and the fact that um, Anybody care to guess how many prior developers have put in paperwork to develop the site for residential use? Anybody care to guess? Zero. Zero? I have zero? Ten. You're wrong, by the way. Ten. Zero to ten. Okay. If the range is zero to ten, anybody care to guess? Four. Four is good. Six. <clears throat> Six so far. And they've all not been successful. And I, I want to share that with you because part of this is the city is moving toward development. And it's the people have tried to develop this in the past. There's a lot of reasons why they failed, but I want you to know that there is a lot of history of people trying to develop it for condominiums. Now, is anybody here, um, well, I know you're not feeling well. Uh, does anybody here remember the smell of Cliff Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like the, everybody in the room to kind of bear with me on this. Shut your eyes for a second, take a deep breath of the room air. And then out through your nose. My favorite smell, library. The best smell in the world. Now, I cannot bring in the smell of Cliff's Dow. It's too dangerous. It's chemical smell, and you can have a very bad reaction to it. However, when I put on Facebook, I was looking for wood tar in case somebody had some. Two different people said, this tea reminds me of the Cliff Dow smell. And I thought, 
thought they were being silly, but they're not. I, I got the tea from the internet. It's in three plastic bags. Andrew, I'm going to hand it to you first. My recommendation is that you open the bag and get to this level and go just a little bit, okay? Unless you want to clear out your nose really good, and then you go, Ugh! And then um, I say that because this is one-tenth as bad as the smell from Clist Out when it was operating. One-tenth. And the reason I say this is because the first complaint that's going to happen when you develop this property is the smell. Since the property was shut down in 69, the State Department of Environmental Quality, whatever its name, the DNR, the DEQ, now it's Eagle, has averaged two to three complaints a month from different people who have smelled that smell. It hasn't gone away. Uh, have you ever smelled anything that bad? It's an interesting smell. Yeah, it's, it's made with smoked wood, and, and it's, that's the Cliff-style smell only. That one is dry. The Cliff-style smell when it was operation was choking wet and thick on you. Yeah, anyway. So, we're talking about the smell of Cliff-style. It has never gone away, and I'm going to keep coming back to that as a theme, because it comes back to the challenges we face with this piece of property. Um, I started talking and I didn't go back to my slides. Bad presenter. This was the only picture I could find of Cliff Stow when it was in operation. This is from the 30s. You can see the gentleman in the corner with the push mower to give you perspective. That smoke ran 24-7, 365 days a year. There was never a break, never an interruption. It, and it was always that black and always that thick. So for the entire time the plant was in operation, that black smoke was an integral part of that part of Marquette. What perspective lines, where, where are we looking from here? I would say we're looking from Presque Isle towards the lake because this is the administration wing which faced Presque Isle. This, there was no buildings there, Paul, when this was put together. Yeah. There, oh, excuse me, Commissioner, apologize, oh, titles. Um, but there was no buildings, there was no, there's nothing in, in North Marquette when Jim Kosky does his uh, presentation in January. He and I have talked. This area was completely unbuilt up, and the trees, and there was a swamp there, and there was nothing there. And the nice part of the site facing Presque Isle was the administrative buildings, and the other side facing uh, Lake, Lakeshore Drive, Lake, Lakeshore Boulevard, was the uh, manufacturing site. There were multiple railroad tracks coming in. Welcome. Hi. Just got started. Um, are you with Northern? Yes. Oh, Lord. Apparently Siri registered you. Oh. Are you bugged? No. <laughs> I'm just I, hope, I hope not. I, ap I apologize. I just, oh. My phone doesn't usually... I can't turn off my phone. I'm a caregiver for my 92-year-old mother. Welcome. We just got started. Um, this is the plant as it operated. You cannot, unless you drove past it, imagine what that smoke was like. It was like shut all the windows and get past it, and then you get on the island, and everything was okay on the island because the breeze blew it away. The island didn't smell like Clistel, but right in front of Clistel smelled like Clistel. And if the breeze came from offshore and saturated North Marquette, that's where company housing was. And nobody could put up their washing to hang or anything like that because the, the, the smell was really bad. Okay, now I'm already talking too much. History of the Cliff Style Chemical Company, third time I've given this presentation. It's a living, breathing presentation. I have multiple Freedom of Information Act requests in with many different government agencies, and every time I get another stack of papers, I expand upon this. So it's a living, breathing presentation. Okay, why should I care? First of all, I love the puppy dog. It's, uh, it's, this is the slide where I'm supposed to persuade you why this is important to you. Um, why should I care about it? Because the site is under active consideration for development as a residential neighborhood. That's why you should care about it. And what this means to you as a uh, representative of the people, as a representative of the state, as a person who loves the lakeshore, as a person who got her toes wet in Lake Superior for the first time in five years in, in, that, in that soil, what does it mean to you? It means a lot to me. Okay, the location of Cliff Style, in case you're not familiar with the area, this is an aerial picture. Some of these I got from Jack Dale, some of these I got from the Regional Historical Center. But that's Lakeshore Boulevard. You can see the Lombardi poplars were very prevalent. You can see there was a lake, there was a beach. 
And you can see the railroad cars and the lumber in the lower left-hand picture. And then up on the top of the picture was the chemical manufacturing area. And then you can see North Marquette was nothing but woods. There was no development. There was no houses. And the houses to the right of the plant, there were company houses called the Furnace. And it wasn't the best housing in the world. Welcome, Cody. Very happy that you could make it tonight. Appreciate it. Uh, it, this was how it looked. This is where it was. And this is still the area under development. This is actually a really good picture because there's much of it that's not um, big of concern. Most people think Clistow started in 35. They actually were making charcoal on that site since 1903. What difference does that make? Dear friends, when they pull down Wee Energy, which is right next to it, they're going to find charcoal residue under Wee Energy because Cliffs, Cleveland Cliffs made charcoal to make pig iron right next to the boats that took it on the ore boats. They have been manufacturing for over 60 years, making charcoal with the debris that comes from that for over 60 years. So you, you don't have just one generation of pollution there, you have over two and a half under no pollution controls whatsoever, under no state, city, anybody. No one cared what they did or where they dumped it. And I say that now because you can't you can't imagine the world they lived in at the time when they did this. But this is the timeline. It really is a history. Uh, market site was chosen. They needed water. One of the big things that you're going to hear me come back to is the first thing that's going to happen next year is they're going to build a new road. The, the, they got a grant from the Lakeshore uh, Partnership. They also have to pull up the water pipe that's still in the water leading from Plistow out into the water. It's three feet wide, 1,800 feet long, and it's still there. No one cleaned it up. And it's really a point of concern because it's in a navigable waterway. It's where the ore boats come in and come out again. And if these terrible storms we're having break that pipe loose, uh, the Coast Guard will get involved. And the Coast Guard uh, has absolute authority over navigable waterways. So you're talking about one of the things the state didn't find it again until 2016. It's on one of the earlier diagrams I have. But they, didn't have, they never pulled up their water pipe. It's still there. And what's in it, you'd hope it was water and sand. But even if they capped it at the land, we know that there's different pathways where the chemicals that are in the ground have made their way out to the water. And so this pipe has to be pulled out. And it's, it's not a task that I've seen listed to get the, to get the work done, but it's still there. Okay, uh, Cleveland Cliffs uh, is a mining company. They used to ship their uh, iron and what's called pig iron, where they took it and used charcoal to smelt it into a mold, and that mold went on the boats. In about 1920, 1930, they started the pelletizing process, which is little pellets that go down the chutes. But for over 50 years, they used pig iron, and they made charcoal here. This side, this picture, I had no idea. We have a, a iron ore heritage trail. We're rebuilding one kiln. I had no idea until I got this picture from the Regional Historical Center. They had 100 kilns running 24-7 to make charcoal. No environmental concerns about the residue of that charcoal manufacturing for 30 years. And that was at the Cliff Dow site. And it was there. And the, the railroads and the wood and everything that went into making charcoal, row after row after row of cement kilns. And these kilns, you can see them better in this angle. Good charcoal. Um, how many of you have made a charcoal grill and used charcoal in a grill to burn meat? Okay. Why don't you use wood to cook the meat? I do. Okay. The reason they use charcoal to make pig iron is if you just cook wood, you get the residue of the wood on what you're cooking. For example, if you put wet wood into a, a if you heat it with wood as a kid, like I did, um, if you put wet wood into your stove, you don't get that much heat out of it. You get a lot of debris because wood will gunk up on you. Well, charcoal has all of the gunkies burned off of it. It's just pure wood. And here's the time for my demonstration here. Can't have that on the video. Um, this is hardwood charcoal. And if you want to open the bag and look at it, you'll get dirty. There's no reason why you can't open the bag and look at it. That is what they made. They never made it into briquettes. They made hardwood charcoal and used it as pig iron. 
if a uh, twist valve for many years took hardwood charcoal, ground it up, mixed it with binders, and made charcoal briquettes. But that was charcoal for 30 years. That's what's left of wood after you burn off everything else. And you can buy that, by the way, on the internet still. And there's still some people who use it. But that's charcoal. Uh, again, if you just think of charcoal, you think of the briquettes. And for 30 years, it was industrial. All right. Uh, this is a lot of chemistry. Basically, uh, charcoal has tremendous use. It's been in use by every culture in the world, Andrew, including Native Americans. It was recognized immediately by people who burned wood that if you burned off all the other residue, the stuff that remained had very good attributes. It burned hot, <clears throat> it didn't leave a residue on what you were cooking. So every culture for over 30,000 years has made charcoal. Uh, charcoal burns hotter and cleaner. It's ancient. And then if your last name is Collier, did anybody ever know somebody named Collier? That meant your family was in the charcoal manufacturing business. That's the name of the people who made charcoal. It was a skill set handed down from father to son, family to family. If you were a charcoal manufacturer, you were in great demand. OK, Cleveland Cliffs, three water pumps. They brought in more water. Um, they started cast iron in 1903. They started chemical recovery in 1908. And the phrase pyroligneous acid and wood tars is very important because the first time they made charcoal, they just let everything that wasn't charcoal burn off in that smoke. But if they put a pipe on the, the chamber and cool it, they distill it down, they get the pyroligneous acid and the wood tar. And from that, they extract useful chemicals. And so for a long time, they did extract chemicals in the early days of charcoal manufacturing. Then they put the distillation, what they call it, a pipe, and cooled it off and started actually doing chemical manufacturing there, um, which made for a lot of uh, <clears throat> valuable chemicals being made. Uh, pyroligneous acid, wood vinegar, wood acid is a dark liquid, and you, got, you can extract acetic acid, acetone, and methanol. It was used as a commercial source for a lot of chemicals. This became really important in World War I because the Americas and the Allies were cut off from the German chemical combines. So Cliffs, Cleveland Cliffs charcoal manufacturing became important for chemical manufacturing in World War I. And then uh, they still manufacture liquid smoke. You can buy it in the store to make your meat taste like barbecue. Only they pretty much have stopped selling it now because they realized the stuff in wood, wood smoke contains carcinogen uh, comp compositions. So this is stuff where I, I keep using the word ignorance versus ignorance to me means they didn't know any better. Uh, lack of common sense means they should have known better. And right now we're at the term where they're in pure ignorance. They're doing with charcoal what everybody else is doing. It's very valuable. They're making a lot of money. People are happy. And then uh, really important what type of wood you use. We have a lot of hardwood up here. And there's va valuable uh, wood tar was viewed as something of value. It wasn't viewed as a nasty. Now when I use the phrase wood tar, I mean it as a swear word. I really do. Wood tar, swear word. OK. Uh, most people don't know this. In 1916, there was a massive explosion that completely destroyed the plant. And there was speculation that German saboteurs had blown it up. And if you think I'm exaggerating, I am not. The plant was that valuable to the American war effort. It made a whole bunch of chemicals. And the whole thing went down and uh, blew it up. And this is another thing. Um, later on, I'm going to talk to you about uh, some some people have used the phrase, well, the state will say it's safe to do this. The state has the best information possible. They'll never say it's safe. They'll say it doesn't require any more remediation. But these types of explosions, this one that leveled the plant and others that took place, they destroy all maps you had of the plant. Whatever you think was in a certain location, once you're done with an explosion like that, it's anywhere you can think of. And by the way, this charcoal manufacturing went all the way up to where the ore dock is, where the power plant is. It's on both sides of the Dead River. So when they pulled out the energies, which thankfully the city doesn't own, uh, those um, arbitrary lines of who owns the property are going to run into the fact that these explosions scattered that stuff all over. 
And they rebuilt it. It was so valuable, Cleveland Cliffs turned around and rebuilt it. And they started extracting chemicals, more chemicals than charcoal. They never sold charcoal at this stage. They just made natural charcoal for pig iron. But as the need for pig iron declined and the need for pelletized iron increased, they decided to stop making pig iron at the dock. And in 1933, they shut it down. And this was the beginning of the Depression. And when they shut it down, Marquette was in a world of hurt because it was a huge employer, not just of people working at the <coughs> plant, but it brought in a lot of wood. So a lot of the foresters in the area lived and died bringing in Cleveland Cliffs wood. And that becomes important later on when Cleveland Cliffs Dow started up and what it meant to wood production in this part of the world. So the takeaway from this is, long story short, charcoal manufacturing, 1902, 1933, very dirty, very polluting, no rules, no regulations, many explosions, tossing the wood tar in many different directions. So all of the things that I'm about to say when we talk about after Cliff's Dow, I want you to remember that there was never a smooth line in the sand where it, the mess is only on this side of the line and on that side of the line it's okay. All right? You're a good audience. I can see you're still with me. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Clistow Chemical Company was a combination of the Cleveland Cliffs Iron Mining Company and the Dow Chemical Company. They formed in 35 because Cliff uh, had the wood and had the location, and Dow had a dire need of chemical production made from wood. Now we make most of our chemicals from petrochemicals, from oil, but at this time they still made a lot of chemicals from wood. And not so much from coal, because as you know, there's no coal in this part of the world. But wood, we have. So in 1935, Cleveland Cliffs had the location, the Dow Chemical Company sent people over to Europe. They were interested in something called the Schuller process, which is a complicated process to extract methanol from wood. And they decided eventually not to run it at this site, but that was their thinking, is they were going to run the Schuller process here. Um, what did this mean to Marquette? 40 cents an hour. That was the going rate for labor. This was the depression. And, and I don't, I cannot begin to describe to you how desperate people were for work that paid cash money in those days. There was no, the mines were shutting down all over the Upper Peninsula because the demand for iron was decreasing. And every time a mine shut down, a person packed up their family and went to where they thought there'd be another mine work. And it, it just was a cascading effect as more mines shut down. So when Cliff Stiles started up, there was no, no challenge to them whatsoever. It was, here's the key to the city. Whatever you want, you get. 40 cents an hour meant $15 a week. And with that, a person could live and keep a family going. So from the beginning, there was a desperate choice made to survive on that 40 cents an hour. And I thank Mayor uh, Smith for that pin. It was, it's in her family. That's an employee pin from the Cliff Stiles company. Okay, here's the plant when it was going. Those stacks in the lower right hand corner are wood. 11 miles of railroad track, continuous hauling in of wood. Uh, they had their own locomotive engines. I gave this speech the last time and two guys came in and said, my dad was the railroad. Um, he ran the locomotive and they said, what shift? And apparently one guy was the day shift, one guy was the night shift and these two guys met after all these years and they were looking at pictures of people running the railroads trying to figure out which of their dads it was. It was a massive operation. Matt, you cannot comprehend how much wood had to be used for 24-7. Um, this is stacks, this, again, the, the Historical Society, Jack Dale, had these pictures. Stacks and stacks and stacks of wood they never could run out. 330 workers employed there. Always was, from 35 to 69, always was the largest employer in the city of Marquette. Always was. That was what a big deal it was. Um, 330 workers at the plant and then 200 people outside of Marquette bringing in wood. And that still wasn't enough to make sure they had enough wood. So they sent around what's called the, the cliff style wood truck. And imagine you're living out in the swamps, which a lot of people did, getting by on what you could poach, what you could grow, what you could gather. And uh, the cliff style truck came around and you and your family had gathered wood chips from the woods and the gentleman gave you cash, even a dollar for wood that was sitting on the ground and you could bring it in there. So Cliff's Dow, when it was running in the 30s and 40s, was revered 
It, the smell was terrible. Everybody knew it. But if you complain about the smell, the father of the family would say, the smell means food on the table. That was the trade-off they made. I, I want to say this because I've spent my life in the American chemical industry, and I will not bash the American chemical industry. Bad decisions have been made throughout the history, but that you have no idea of the history of Cliffs Dow and what it meant to this town until you look at those numbers and those statistics. And then they, this time they made charcoal bri briquettes for the growing. It didn't used to be home charcoal. It didn't used to be home barbecue. But Cliff made the be arguably the best charcoal in the United States. It was no wide and far for that. Hardwood charcoal is the best charcoal. Later on, they made it with scrap wood. It wasn't nearly as good. Uh, by the way, does anybody know where Kingsford charcoal came from? Henry Ford. And his automotive works in the Detroit area had a lot of waste wood, and he couldn't stand waste, so he asked a friend of his name, Kingsford, to run a charcoal plant. And for a long time, it was Ford charcoal, and they finally turned it into Kingsford charcoal. So again, charcoal, the theme here. Margaret, did they have a plant up also? What was the plant up in Big Bay? Uh, the, with Kingsford? the plant in Big Bay was not the charcoal plant. That plant was to bring in wood for the woody. And the other wood, the, the Model T, I think, was about 40% wood. And it wasn't until much later that the wood decreased to where it was minimal. But most of Ford's holdings in the Upper Peninsula were for the, the wooden components of the vehicle. And the Model T, 40%. The Woody station wagon was 60% because the sides were made out of wood. And I, I'm sorry, I don't know all the, the all of the different locations they had in the Upper Peninsula. But no, it, it's just, it's, um, I've been told that it's been associated with it. And it wouldn't surprise me if some of the byproducts and leftovers that were used in the auto industry were used then with the uh, uh, manufacture and production of Kingsford charcoal or the, the charcoal. Component. That's where it started from. Henry Ford had them sweep the floor of any splinters and he wouldn't waste it. It had to go into charcoal manufacturing. All of these chemicals here, I'm not going to drain them out. All of these have enormous value. Acetic acid is vinegar, but there's different, it's a, also a component of many different other processes. Creosote oils. Uh, you shouldn't let me shop on the internet after midnight because these are from a model railroad set and they're platforms with creosote coated wood. And the reason I brought them here for you to look at was you can see the difference in the um, size, excuse me, that you can see the difference in the color. The wood was treated with creosote to protect it against the elements and was used as railroad ties and as telephone poles, telegraph poles. So the creosote was valued for that reality. Thank you. Which is, by the way, another um, point. There's creosote soaked wood on that property too, right now. Um, again, the debris that's still on that property is a multi-component level of debris, including creosote soaked wood. Okay, methanol was a big one. Now, this slide is from the, it, I, I couldn't ask for a better slide. Why are we still worried about wood tar? The plant hasn't been manufactured for, since 69. It's because for every 10 pounds of hardwood, you made over one pound of tar. Do the math. There's just tons of wood tar. And it, they put it anywhere they could think of. They use some of it to heat to, for, for, um, to run the, the equipment. They put some of it into coating things. They put some of it into other uses, and then they dumped it. There was a dump site out on County Road 550, and there was a dump site at the plant when they couldn't get to work, County Road 550. And there's a document in Northern's archives. NMU has the archives for R.W. Jenner, who was the last president of the Clistow Chemical Company. And this is where the city ought to take a look at those documents, because I think the contract that when the city bought the property and assumed all the liability, they could have relied upon his statement in those documents saying, hardwood tar is non-hazardous. He flat out says it's non-hazardous. The only hazard is it gets on your shoes. And that was uh, ignorance at the time. But again, the city relied upon that when they bought it. So you got, from hardwood, you got charcoal, you got pyroligneous liquid, you got acetic acid, hardwood tars was always there. It was always a byproduct. Okay, um, and I just finished telling you this. I'm getting ahead of my slides, but that's okay. I'm trying to get you through this. 
Russell Jenner recalls the methods of business used there was determined entirely by its management. No government intervention whatsoever. No city, no state, no federal. That becomes more and more important as we talk about why it's still contaminated now. It's because when you don't have any rules to follow, you don't worry about what you do when you do something. And then later on, when you try to think of cleaning it up, you can't really comprehend how much of a mess it is because you don't think like that anymore because we've been raised in a society where there are rules about everything. Um, no pollution controls, no analysis of what was underground or growing into Lake Superior. Uh, suitable water supply. They used more water at that plant than the city of Marquette did. And the main water intake pipe is still there. And again, one of my takeaways from this is that's got to be removed and before you do this massive development on the lakefront. Whatever you do there, that pipe's got to come out of the water. That is the thing that if it breaks loose and, and becomes a hazard to navigation, the Coast Guard will hunt it down and remove it and the city will have to pay. And I don't mean to frighten anybody with that, it's just really dangerous. Yes, ma'am? Do you have a map to show where that pipe is? Well, yes, I do, actually. Um, do you have time to look at that? I, I, I have, uh, I was about to say, they had the original, ah, here it is, intake pipe right here. This, by the way, I didn't make this up. I didn't draw this. This wasn't a secret. This has been in the files. I'm just the first one on a long time to look for it. Does the city know about this? I've been told that the city knows about this. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. What exactly is in the pipe that makes it of such concern? It's a, uh, a pipe. It's three feet wide. Okay? It's still there. They've mapped it. It goes straight out. Then it goes up into a T, and then it comes down again. So first of all, the hazard is if it breaks apart, it's a hazard to navigation. The Coast Guard will get involved. Number two. It was an entranceway for water to come into the plant, but even though the plant blocked it off, we now know that there's underground rivers of chemicals going from Clifstow into the lake. Uh, they call them plumes, they call them all sorts of things, but basically about 35 feet down, there's rivers of waste material still making their way into Lake Superior. Question? Well, I, I so bad. Well. well, we have multiple wells analyzing what goes into the, the lake. And I took issue recently with a city employee who said it's getting better because I've read the recent studies and sometimes some component goes down and another one goes up. And just recently they had an uptick in about five or six different chemicals they looked for. Because as the the, the, the underground takes a beating from the weather. There's no other way to describe it. It releases more chemicals, and the wood tar that was leaking might be stopped, but another plume of wood tar would be. The city's tri-media engineer in their most recent report, which was this summer, acknowledged the existence of multiple pools of wood tar underneath the, the surface of the land. Multiple pools. And I believe them. I mean, they've been tasked with doing this for the city for multiple years. Uh, anyway, this, this is this is the. I, I mean, this was always there. In 2017, the the state paid for a hydrological exam, and they found the pipe again. So I guess that's where I'm, my biggest question would be: knowing that it's been there all along, why hasn't it been such a hot button up, up until now, especially with the. Uh, um, you know, the amount of boat traffic that we've had. I can understand where you're going with it, but it's, you know, this is not, this is a, this is a hundred year old pipe city. Well, first of all, it's a good question. As long as it was underwater and the water was relatively stable, I can see why your point is well taken and no one was using that water for anything other than transit over the pass. It wasn't where the old boats turned around. It was right. next to it, but it wasn't there. What's changed in the last five years is the storm level has pounded that beach to the point where, as you know, it's going to be removed, or it's going to be moved, the load's going to be moved. What's going to happen as more and more storms happen is the pipe is over 100 years old. Pipes don't last that long. And it was uh, looked at with hydrological in instruments, not visually, 
but it's still uh, there and it's still intact now. Uh, as it stands now, I would expect with the beating the shoreline has been getting, underwater has been getting the same level of beating. That, that's my concern as a person. Um, have you ever, I, by the way, I'm one of the few people on the planet who actually has worked at CCI as a miner and also worked for the Dow Chemical Company as an engineer. Have you ever had the privilege of going through a mine and having them show you what the inside of the pipes look like after they've been running a slurry of dirt for a while? Uh, you get a pipe that starts off about four inches and it's down to about a half an inch because of wear and tear on the inside of the pipe. I would hope that uh, when they pull the pipe, it's full of water and sand. That would be my best hope. Uh, I would expect that there's other things that are flowing along there. That would be my best bet. But I don't, this is my personal opinion as an engineer. It's not in those documents. But I can't see how you're going to rebuild the road and build that new beautiful beach without pulling that pipe. I don't see how you can do that. Okay? Well, right. and I, I totally respect that, uh, the information that you're giving us. At the same time, you know, the abandonment of that pipe, <coughs> um, you know, like you said, hopefully it's filled with sand and, and you know, nothing more. Uh, I, and I agree with you that there's definitely leaching from the deposits that have been left behind on the site um, with the plumes. To say that there's rivers of waste going back into the to the lake, I, I think there's, it's a little bit maybe a bit more dramatic than we need to go. But it's it's certainly true that there is leaching occurring, and I would hope that you know uh, there's never a good time to say that there's chemical flowing back into the lake. But as Mother Nature does so well, uh, it's kind of her way of saying, okay, we'll take time and, and hopefully things will work themselves out. We all know that the plumes are very well pronounced and are, are very well monitored by the uh, uh, people that are doing the um, excuse me, doing the, uh, the the well drilling and monitoring of them, and uh, they've got a pretty good hold on on where they are and how they uh, are situated. But uh, and there's no discounting any of that. I totally agree with you. In the, uh, the city has made that point before, and I'm represented by their. Um, party that went into the state that said uh, this is natural, that it's leakage, and that uh, eventually it'll decline because that's the way things are. I have a letter from the state, which if you stay later, I will get you that letter, that uh, discounts that position for two reasons. Number one, the plant was shut down for 35 years and they're still detecting chemical. So the natural remediation you're talking about, um, we had 60 years of constant pollution there. And it's still ri at river. I use the word river to me. Plume sounds like a feather, and I don't like the phrasing. But it's not a solid river. It's leachate that comes out, and it comes with chemicals depending on how much it hits. But the problem again, I'm going back to your point, which is natural occurring. Also, the things they're finding, not all of them biodegrade, and the state listed the heavy metals that are underneath the northern soccer field. You from Northern, yeah. they built the soccer fields over land that was known to be <coughs> contaminated with heavy metals. Do you they, know what metals? I do, and it's in a slide. Okay, right. And Northern worked with the state and did a remediation on that. However, Northern has neglected to put up signs telling people not to dig there. And that was part of the remediation. Um, and again, Commissioner, that's a very good point, and I will show you the letter where that was hashed out as well. It's most people think, and I'm not being silly when I say this, the solution to pollution is dilution. Eventually it'll all go away. Why I start with the 1903 charcoal is there's just so much. And as much as I would like to say they've cleaned it up, they never did the comprehensive cleaning necessary to have that effect where it just trickles out. It's, there's still too much there. Um, let me keep going. Um, That's a great question. Yes, sir. Who's responsible for remediating that pipe? Is the city of Marquette or is it the company that put it in? Uh, we'll talk about that later because the responsibility is one of the things we'll get into. This is another aerial view, but again, it's mostly helpful why there was no neighbors to the, <coughs> the other side. All of this smoke and mirrors was going to the left out to the lake. This part, they didn't know they were having wood tar go that way. They thought it was all going towards the lake. 
And mind you, Marquette as a city didn't have sewage treatment until 52. So all the while that, most of the while that Crystal was operating, they were discharging raw sewage into Lake Superior. It was a different time. There were different rules and different expectations. I'm not saying it was good, I'm just saying it was a different time. Okay, I'll go through this relatively fast. This is fascinating to me. These are retorts where they would put the wood in, cook the heck out of it, extract the chemicals, and end up with charcoal as well. And it's called a retort, and on the maps that I have, they know where the retorts were. Uh, these tended to leak and occasionally explode as well. Um, this is another uh, plant view. You can see the gentleman in the corner for perspective. It was dirty, dangerous, and very difficult work. And the gentlemen who worked there were paid union wages for their shower at the end of the day. And I can tell you working in the CCI, we had showers, but we weren't paid to take a shower. But, C but Cliff Stow actually paid their guys to take a shower before they left the plant. It was, you couldn't walk on that site. Forget about the smell. You couldn't walk on that site without being covered in charcoal dust. Um, okay, and it was world famous. It was a state-of-the-art facility, as bad as it was. Uh, destructive distillation of wood. Uh, Dow put a tremendous amount of money into it to make the process run as best as possible. They had visitors from all over the world. Men, you know, you, you think of Marquette as being the end of the world, and not, now we're connected. Well, Chris Dow connected us to a lot of different people at a lot of different times. Uh, this has to do with local. There's patents that came out of the work there. Al Camilli was a named inventor on that patent. He was also um, the father of our babysitter growing up. <laughs> but uh, he worked at the Clistal. The guy next to him worked in the plant at Clistal. They didn't get along very well because one was management and the other one was a worker. But all over Marquette, there was Clistal. And they made it the best as possible. These are more patents. I mean, the combustible gel at the bottom one of the inventors was George Greminger, who I worked with in the cellulose ether TSD department um, when I joined Dow in 79. And they, he put um, a thickener into a uh, charcoal lighter to try to make it work better. And so uh, he was the expert in ethacel, is what it was called. Um, it just says there's, a, there's too much connection between me and Cliff Dow for me to think that anybody else should write this besides me regardless of what happened. Uh, and then they kept inventing all the way through the 60s. And then it was very dangerous. Uh, confined space entry is the most dangerous thing you can do in any manufacturing facility. And they lost this young man who died a hero. He looked down into an acetic acid tank. His guys were cleaning out and they were unconscious. He went down to get them. They got out alive. He didn't. Uh, again, uh, mining was very dangerous. Mining underground was the worst, but mining per se was dangerous. Cliff style was very dangerous. Uh, boats were very dangerous. This is the type of employment that was available. And um, again, he died a hero. The team manager, his name was George Johnson, in case any of you know this story. Now, this is the charcoal manufacturing. I heard from a lot of guys in the 60s. Uh, the Red Owl paid a dollar an hour to be a bag boy. Uh, Cliff style paid a dollar 75 or dollar 87, depending on what year you were in school. And you could do a double shift there, and you get overtime, plus they would get you a pasty, a cargo milk, and an apple pie. <laughs> so it was considered a good summer job. And a lot of young men made a decent living. And if your boss liked you, you worked in the charcoal bagging. But if he didn't like you, you worked in the char bagging, when char was just powdered charcoal. And it sounds like it shouldn't be a problem, except you didn't have a respirator. You just had a little paper mask. And so when the char came down, <laughs> You got, you got the tea smell in your face 24-7. And unfortunately, as I talk to people about Cliff Stow, if they're of a certain generation, they can name all the people in their family who are no longer with us from various types of ailments they blame on Cliff Stow. And there's no doubt that there was no regulation to protect the workers. They had a union. It was not what I would consider to be a strong union. They settled many times for pennies on the dollar for wage increases, as opposed to mining. Um, anyway, and this is more uh, state of the art. I, these are pictures and newspaper articles that from the library here. They have a fantastic archive. And it was always considered vitally needed. During World War II, it won J awards for industrial output. 
They run pilot plants for different chemical processing that the government was getting involved in. Some of it connected with uh, the Manhattan Project for different chemistry. It was never old or out of date or considered that. It was state of the art all the, all the while it was running. And then all the while it was running, there were people um, who were aware that um, they would put the waste into the groundwater and it would eventually leach into Lake Superior. This letter is from 2009. Uh, there were 15, 20 different versions of this letter in some of the files. They're all in the state. Uh, the, the, the person kept urging the state to contact uh, the right people, ask the old employees about this because they knew when it was running they were pumping waste directly into the groundwater, not 200 yards from Lake Superior. Um, and Commissioner Schlegel, when you talk about rivers being the wrong word, it's probably too strong a word. However, groundwater migration is probably the number one concern of the state right now. That's the thing they've been pounding on the city for the last 10 years about, groundwater migration. And I put this letter in here because the pain in the person who typed this, you can feel it when he's typing it. He desperately wants somebody to fix it. Okay, charcoal company of Wycliffe's Dow, the reason they sold it is in 1969. Anybody care to guess who was president? Nixon. Nixon. Anybody care to guess a standard of the Republican Party in 1969? What are their platforms they ran on? EPA. EPA. They created the Environmental Protection Agency in 1969. And Dow, Dow saw the writing on the wall. And R.W. Jenner is quoted in a document as saying there was no way the Claystow plant could be remediated to operate under any government regulation. So the recommended was sold. And so it was sold to Royal Oak, who immediately built a new office building for the executives. They knew what was important. And when Clistow sold it to them, they gave them a list of where all of the tar was on property and told them what to do to mitigate it. And when they shut it down a year later, uh, none of that had been done. So basically, the plant remained as bad as it was, except for the office building for the execs, uh, since Clistow shut it down. And it closed it in the summer of 69. And um, if you want to talk about gloom and doom and how are we going to survive, it was the largest employer in the city of Marquette. And they had no way to replace it in any way, shape, or form. And keep in mind, all of the people that kept employed, union people, they kept employed in the woods, bringing in a wood for them. And there was no more market for it. So I, I wanted to give that as perspective, as Marquette has faced really hard times before when a major employer went down and survived. But this was a massive blow to the city of Marquette. Okay, what happened since then? The Royal Oak Company, nobody calls it the Royal Oak Company. They weren't here long enough. Um, since the summer of 69, that's the old entrance building that was off of Wright Street. Before they extended Wright Street from Presque Isle down to Lakeshore Boulevard, that was the entrance of Cliff Stow. It was all, it was all um, closed off. This is, uh, you asked me whether they're, they're developing. If I can walk over here. This is from Trimedia. Again, every slide I have has a source document behind it, if any of you are interested. I'm not making any of this up or exaggerating it. Uh, the, the property to the left, way up high, the BioLife Plasma Service is a business where people come and go during the day. Uh, the property down here, the NMU Athletic uh, parking lot, and uh, the soccer fields, and that's the dome. And um, I'm glad someone from Northern is here because when the smell comes back and is, cannot be remediated, uh, all those people who use that area are going to wonder what they're smelling because they're too young to know what it is. And that's when um, the city will get questions. And, and I say that not as a, a, a nastiness, it's just it's going to happen. Now, the, the land for proper development is the centerpiece. The centerpiece is 46 acres. I have to say this because people think of Coast Isle as a monolith, and it's not. The, the, the property is broken into three segments. Three very different things happen. 
move around, they say, when you do a presentation. Don't stand in one spot. People will get bored. <laughs> okay, when I went to see the state, I asked to see the Cliff-style documents. What's happened since it shut down? This is what was waiting for me in the conference room. It started at the left-hand table. One, two, three. That's how much they have to date. And that um, it continues to grow. It has never stopped. There has never been a time when the state said, you're done. There has never been a time when the city of Marquette got any communication from the state saying, it's OK. I'm not saying that to be mean or cruel, but I think it's a really important point to make that the state has never said, it's OK. Um, this is the first big thing that got fixed was the dump site off of County Road 550. If you can see it, it's this little scratchy area here. Um, do you remember the great movie Casablanca? And uh, Captain Renault was ordered by the mean Nazi to shut down Rick's bar. He said, what excuse do I have? Make something up. And uh, Captain Renault goes to Humphrey Bogart's character and says, Rick, I'm shocked, truly shocked, to find out you have gambling going on here. And the croupier comes up and says, your winnings, Captain Renault. He said, oh, thank you very much. I must shut you down for gambling. We are shocked, very shocked, to find out there was a dump site on County Road 550 where they had a depression in the ground and dump trucks came in and dumped wood tar. And guess what? It was found by people because it doesn't degrade. And when you walk over it, it covers your feet. And uh, some of the people who later on had to go to the Cliffstyle property couldn't get the wood tar off even with steam. They had to use methanol washing. It was that bad. So this was the first Superfund site. Do you know how bad a site has to be to make the Superfund? Each state was allowed to name 100 sites in the original EPA Superfund. Cliffsdale was responsible for two in the state of Michigan. Think about that. Think about how bad that wood tar was and how the Superfund money, people think it was cleaned up. I started giving this presentation and one lady came to see me and said, my brother lives out there and he said they missed a lot of stuff. What are you going to do about it? And I'm like, well, I'll put it in the presentation. I'll let people know. But the first thing they did was clean up the Cliffsdale site off of County Road 550. And this was the first one, 20,000 cubic yards, benzene, xylene, chloroform, phenol, and other organic compounds. This belies the fact that the president of the company said it was harmless. These are the components of wood tar. These are not harmless things. I was going to get a bottle of phenol here so you could smell it. And this is where I have to be very, very uh, straight with you. If I was in a chemical lab, fully equipped with fume hoods, and you all were in proper protective clothing with goggles, I would open the bottle of phenol in the fume hood and let you stick your head in and kind of go like this and smell it. But it's not safe to have a bottle of any of this stuff in this room. It's not safe because I don't have a fume hood. And if it spills, we got to evacuate this whole area. they got to rip up the carpeting. And I can't afford that. These are nasty chemicals. When I say nasty, I spent my whole life in the American chemical industry. I've worked in the labs. I've made paint. These are not things that are benign. These are things you don't want to have in contact with living things. Now, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, if you wonder my motivation, I'm a practical environmentalist. The second super fun cleanup, this is where the BioLife thing is. That was the on-site cleanup, the Holly Tar Ditch. They took 20,000 cubic yards from there. And it was later sold for $1 and is now the location of BioLife Plasma Services. This past fall, late in the year, they started rerouting the water that was going in the Holly Tar Ditch all the way under the, under the culvert into Lake Superior. They're sending it underneath the road over into the uh, aquifer that enter, empties into the Dead River because it was identified as a point source for some of the contamination that was entering the lake. Part of this has to do with stormwater runoff, which is a hot button topic. Um, but also part of it has to do with the fact that when operating the plant, the Holly Tar Ditch, that lovely little river there, was four feet of wood tar with two feet of water on top of it 24-7. The water would collect and eventually it would all go into, under the culvert into the lake. We were swimming in picnic rocks, there were tar balls there. Because the solution to pollution is dilution, and it went into the water. 
Now, this is one of my themes I'm gonna come, keep coming back to. Why didn't they clean up the Holly Tar Ditch then? The answer is when you do a super fun cleanup, it's not like Superman lands and cleans up everything. The people who own the land get a letter from the federal government saying it's a super fun site. Either you provide us a plan to clean it up or we're gonna clean it up and bill you. Well, of course, the company that owns it sends them a plan that's the minimal cleanup. And then they negotiate with the federal government as to how much more has to be done. So this was never a comprehensive cleanup of the site. And I have to make that point really strongly because I've had enough people say, oh, they cleaned that all up. They didn't. It was a nine acre parcel renamed Bogwam Acres to separate it from the right of the parcel because the first people to try to build condominiums knew they couldn't build them on a Superfund site. So they separated the Bogwam parcel, which was the Superfund site, from the rest of the site. I myself don't think the difference between building on a Superfund site versus building next to it is that big. But they did. So this was the, the second Superfund cleanup. <clears throat> and after the cleanups were done, and the federal government said the Superfund cleanup was OK, then the city made a decision. The city commission of 96 made a decision that we're living with the consequences of. Um, <coughs> the odor has never gone away. <coughs> and then I posted this online from Facebook, September 27th. I just want to mention the other day, after we had hard rain for several days, I was stopped at the corner of Prescott and Wright, and was smelling that old familiar cliff style odor. I know that the mitigation for the building talks about odor barriers. I question whether you can ever stop that odor on any development, because it's everywhere. Uh, for example, if the only analogy I can give, if a skunk walked into the room and sprayed me, aside from laughing and taking a video of it, once you got me out of the room, the rest of you would pretty much be okay because the liquid would be on me. And once I got cleaned up and this corner of the room got cleaned up, you'd probably be okay. But if the skunk came in the middle of the room and twirled in a circle and got every wall and everybody in here, then you can't do a barrier because each person has to be cleaned individually and then the whole room's got to be cleaned. That's the best analogy I can give you. Shoot. Um, i got to go back a slide. In 1997, the city commission authorized the purchase of the process for one dollar. I went to the city commission room and with the permission of the clerk, you're allowed to do this. So the city commission of 96-97 made the decision to buy that site for one dollar. Cameron Howells, Stu Bradley, Emily Coyne, Frank Schoto, Martha Conley, Jack Ledbetter, Jim Schneider. And one of the terms of the sale was they took it with all the liability for the environmental cleanup for one dollar. And this is um, a decision that is with the city now and forever. Uh, it was not a decision they made lightly. They believed at the time that the environmental issue was uh, gone. And I know that for a fact because I've got a letter that breaks my heart when I read it. It's from uh, Judy Arkola to the state, who has been pounding the city for years. Um, the commission finally hired Trimedia to clean things up, and then on the other page, I'll circulate this. We sincerely appreciate your patience involving the site. When the city purchased this property in 97, city administrators told the commission, you're only as good as the people who tell you the information, that the environmental issues at the location were deemed to be minimal. While none of these individuals are employed by the city now, my God, I have visions of them being trucked to the Mackinac Bridge and made to swim, but I mean that sentence, while none of those individuals are with the city now, it does not negate our obligation to ensure the public safety. This is just the worst letter I've ever read in my life. Um, I've already shown it to you, so I'm going to start here. And that city manager of the city, Marquette, had to admit that in 2009, 10 years after they bought it. They bought it with bad, bad information. That's when more condominiums were proposed, by the way, between 97 and 2009. Um, they bought it. They didn't do a BEA, uh, which, which a state document says the city of Marquette goofed up, because if they've done a BEA, it's a baseline environmental assessment. You can buy property and then be excused from being responsible for the, the cleanup. But one of the conditions of buying it for a dollar was they were responsible for the cleanup. 
And this is where I have document evidence where I believe that uh, Dow Chemical misled the city tremendously. Their president said <coughs> the car was harmless, and Dow emphasized that the Superfund cleanup was over. And I do believe that the city commission, when they made that decision, was not given accurate information by the other side. I don't believe for a second that the city commission would have taken on the liability had they known what it was. But they took it on, and we're stuck with it. And this is one of the reasons why I'm giving these presentations, because that liability doesn't go away. And because the city took it on, it's not liable for a grant to clean it up. And this impacts going forward um, all the different things proposed to clean it up. OK? Uh, I, I just that, that letter breaks my heart. OK, first thing that happened is Northern wanted to buy the property in the south for soccer fields and parking lot right next to the dome. And they worked with the state, and this is where the state never said it was safe, but the state came up with a plan. Here it is. You asked, excuse me, young man, I don't mean to point. Um, this is from the documents of the sale. Northern bought it. Northern's responsible for those acres. The city is not responsible for that southern piece anymore. However, underneath the, the cap, arsenic, chromium, lead, and nickel were detected. These do not biodegrade. There is no natural way they biodegrade. They also migrate with the water. So we have Northern on one side of the road. We have the YMCA and Lakeview on the other side of the road. I've not seen any documents where that land has been tested. I imagine as we go forward with this, there will be tests, and it will show different results. But Northern took the property with full knowledge. They followed the mitigation plan. They ripped up everything on top, went down a certain foot, put down a, a, say, a dirt barrier, and forbid digging there. But the one thing they haven't done, um, placing a protective soil layer, um, and then they constructed above it. The one thing they haven't done, this is legalistic, but it's really important legalistic. There should be signage all around that property saying, don't dig. There really should be signage according to the original terms, along with a reference to the restrictive covenant as recorded in the Register of Deeds. And this is where the lawyer part of me came into place. I couldn't put this slide up without going back into exactly where you look for that requirement. This is a critical thing about notice to people uh, who are playing on those fields because, you know, people play in the dirt. I don't know another way to say this. And you don't want to play in that dirt. You don't want to dig in it. You don't. And uh, I went out there. It's publicly available. I broke no law in making this presentation. I'm not an investigative reporter. I wasn't climbing fences in the middle of the night. I went out there during the day. I went through the parking lots. I drove around the field three times. I took pictures of what signs I found. Um, I found that it's, it's not open to the public. Uh, no dogs were allowed. And then I saw that's a, a pump. That's water. And that's a hose. And um, I don't think they should be bringing up water from that site because that water would go through groundwater. Unless that particular hose fitting is hooked up to a municipal water supply. I don't know that. But I was expecting to see these signs saying, don't dig here. Because I found document after document where Northern reports to the city, excuse me, the state every year, we didn't dig there. Example, they had to put up a tower to, so the coach could watch the soccer matches. They had to have a, a state guy come out while they dug the hole for the tower to ensure they didn't breach that barrier. It's that serious a restriction. They're supposed to have signage that says, don't dig. And it's not potable water, do not drink. I'm not sure they understand you shouldn't be rinsing off your cleats with it either. You don't want to come in contact with the water that goes through that dirt. Okay, this is where the pain, our modern pain, starts. Beginning in 2008 or so, water samples show chemicals leaving the site and entering Lake Superior. You know the yellow uh, pipes you see all over when you drive out to the island? Um, those are wells. To, to take water samples from. There's too many to name, and there was more dug this summer. But they've been sampling, and I've got correspondence between the state and the city saying, uh, you need to pay attention to this. You need to pay attention to this. 
And then if you know bureaucratic legalese, there's one letter, um, registered mail, return receipt required. You need to pay attention to this, and the next time we talk, I want you to bring your lawyer and your engineering company. You need to pay attention to this. And that's when the response back from the city was a one-pager saying, we're going to hire an engineering firm to tell us how to clean it up, and we should have uh, it out for bids by next February or something. And the state wrote back and said, that's not what we mean. We need a plan. We need to identify everything that's under there. We need to know what you're going to do to remediate it. We need to know what you're going to do afterwards to ensure it's been remediated. And we need a level of detail that the one pager was found to be inadequate. And it got worse after that, the correspondence between the city and the state. The city asked the state to write the request for proposal to the engineering firm because the city didn't have one to use with the engineering firm. They didn't know how to hire an engineering firm to do this work. And Mr. Harrington from the state very nicely wrote back and said, I don't have a form for you to use. Um, why don't we get together and we'll sketch out some important points together, and then you can and hire them. So the, the city staff was struggling with the requirements of the state, and they tried to do it simply, and the state rejected it. That's an important point because the state has given the city a lot of time to do this. Um, that's Judy's letter again. And I put it in the presentation. And then uh, when they got the notice from the state, they went back and looking at the deal, hoping they could get out of the deal with uh, Cleveland Cliffs and Dow Chemical. What they never, there's no follow up to this. There was no statement as to what happened. I don't believe they had access to the Jenner documents, which clearly showed misleading of the city by Dow Chemical telling them it was harmless. It clearly showed that the city was working with inaccurate <coughs> statements by the other party in here. So I was going to recommend that somebody take a look at that because I found these documents, I looked at them and went, there was never a true contract here. But the city tried, and then, um, I'm, I'm sorry for this uh, reading. The accompanying laboratory data and summary charts have been evaluated, and while the con concentration of certain contaminants in groundwater appear to have recently de decreased, and it, there are also recent increases in the concentration of some contaminants in groundwater at other locations. Um, there's much as a five-fold increase. So when you talk about things are getting better, it's inconsistent to say that. You can say that one well, it's gotten better because whatever was leaching doesn't leach there. Meanwhile, another well, another well has leach it right there, and it's getting worse. And that's because there's wood tar all over that site in different locations. God, I, I feel like I'm in a bad disaster movie right now. Um, but just trying to show you, and this is the most frightening picture I have seen in my life. The city is desperately trying to do the minimal cleanup possible before they sell it to a developer. And meanwhile, the lady who's the manager of the apartment complex right next to the Cliffstow site has her tenants come to her saying there's something in the parking lot that's eating up the asphalt coming up from the ground. And what was eating up the asphalt was wood tar. It migrated from the site through a pipe that nobody knew was there and came up through the ground, through the asphalt, at the Presque Isle apartment complex. One day it wasn't there, and the next day it was there. Now, as a person of some level of common sense, this can happen again. It can happen to the north, it can happen to the south, it can happen to the east, it can happen to the west, because when they mitigated this, Commissioner, they didn't get it all. They just looked for the source that was in Presque Isle and got rid of that. But what happened in Presque Isle, they found an under, underground cavern with a, it was like an old garbage pit, full nine foot by three foot and about this deep, full of wood tar, wood, wood shavings and everything, and a pipe leading to Presque Isle. No map, no recollection, nobody had ever written it down before, nothing in the, in the records of anybody. But imagine if you're going home one day and you go to the, the, the office and say, there's something coming up through the parking lot, and that's where you live. And I cannot, I can't say that any other way. 
this, this idea of putting people on that ground with the state that the ground is in now, and the history of the city doing as little as possible, doesn't match my definition of common sense. And that's a personal opinion. It's not a historical thing. I'm saying it's a personal opinion. There's no common sense. This happened once. It can happen again. And it's blue. I mean, it's like a bad science fiction movie. If it was gray, it wouldn't be as scary, but it's blue. Um, and this is pictures from the mining journals, all over the mining journal. And when they dug underneath, they found a tangle of pipes and wires and underground chambers that was on no map, no understanding of where it was or where it went to. When I talk about rivers and patterns and conduits, sir, there's different ways that material moved through the plant underneath the rock, underneath the ground. And uh, God bless the mining journal, because they did a good job of covering this. Uh, they found the source, and uh, they dug it up. An eight inch diameter cast iron pipe, five to six feet below the surface, and concrete footings that was, for some reason, going to Presque Isle, which is one of those things where if you're a neighbor of Cliff Stowe, Whatever side you're a neighbor on, uh, you would be concerned if they developed more than they did. Um, and this got, this is 2011, by the way. This isn't ancient history. This is eight years ago. This just happened. And that's more than 40 years after the plant shut down. But the, for 60 years, contaminants were dumped on the plant, and nothing was done. And then a little bit was cleaned up here, and a little bit was cleaned up there. And then nature did what it does, which is find a way to move, and it moved. And it moved in the direction where nobody expected it to move towards Presque Isle, not toward the lake. It moved toward the people. And bad smell, a side effect of cleanup. I'm not kidding anybody in this room when I tell you that the manure is going to hit the fan. Everything you do in Cliffstyle is going to start with the smell. You are going to get people sitting in the commission meeting, standing at the podium, talking about gagging on that smell. You're going to talk about people whose bike rides are interrupted, who are walking, whose dog got you know, agitated. That smell is going to be the first thing, because it's still there. It, it, you know, some smells go off in the air, but it had a tar, sticky-like feel to it. It contaminated lunch boxes and work clothing and people. and. It's what everybody remembers. And so when I brought in the, the tea to sh show you what it smelled like, you, you've talked, you, in terms of, I've read everything that's been published by the city, and the city engineers talked about vapor barriers, which work if you have a vapor source that's a point source. But a vapor barrier is not working if you have multiple sources and in fact, the leaves on the trees and the branches are saturated with the smell, too. That's why after every rain, it comes out. It, it's, um, it's just if you wanted to make something that lasted for 100 years, you couldn't. But wood tar has lasted for 100 years. And those are regular people. And, and reading the articles, like, I had hung my jacket outside for three months, and that smell was still there. And I couldn't, you know, I had to move in with my sister. I couldn't gag, and the dog was getting sick. And I'm not making fun of these people. They weren't there when the plant was operating. They thought they were in hell. Excuse me for saying that. And anybody who was with Cliff Stowe was like, yeah, that's what it was. And, and yet you're going to have a lot of new people in town who don't know what it was and don't understand why it's still there and why the city doesn't snap its fingers and deal with it. By the way, activated carbon over there takes away uh, contaminants in water. Uh, they're going to ask you to put activated carbon on that site to clean it up. Um, the hardwood charcoal I bought was about $20, $25. That bag of activated carbon was maybe <clears throat> $75. So the cleanup of the smell is, uh, is something to be budgeted for. All right, and tremendous interest. There's always been interest. There were six different developers who wanted to develop it. Um, even with all the, every time they went on property, this was debris they found. They have never removed everything there. I've got a clipboard here. 
and again, I always have too much stuff to share, but um, there's, there's stuff they found, every time they go on site, there's stuff they found. It, it's not been cleaned up. Um, there's 50 monitoring wells, the mixing zone, and this is when the city got serious about asking the state for a no further action required letter, which means you've cleaned it up enough, you don't have to do any more, you can do what you want with the property. Um, and they did, the state, not the city, did this testing. This is the pipe. If you see these yellow dots here, they used hydrological testing and sonic uh, underwater testing, and that's one pipe they're sure of. They thought there was another pipe up there, but it turned out to be a debris field. But yeah, that pipe's still there. And I don't know why people didn't know that, but I do know that we never thought of that area as a swimming beach. But that's part of the plan, is to make it into a swimming beach. And they've done sampling there, and there's just this thick of sampling results. And every time they sink a new well, the first thing they say is, strong odor notice. The beach sand underneath the water smells like cliff dow. The most recent wells sunk this past summer the man who did the sinking of the wells noted on every well strong odor. The odor of Cliff Stow is still with us. Um, and uh, they sent a request for no further action in May of 2018. I read that letter. The state said, we reject your request. Um, first of all, Ethyl benzene, xylene, naphthalene, and formethylphenol were detected at concentrations above the limits. Okay, uh, at the, in the th three-year groundwater monitoring period, they named it's not a you haven't done enough. It's we're still detecting chemicals that we don't want in the water above the limit that we want them in the water. It's a real thing. They they run the tests and it's they're still coming out of the site. I won't use the word river, but they're still coming out because. They're not staying in one spot. It's not like they get into the water and they stay there. They move on. This is fresh stuff coming out. Um, they, they rejected it. And then uh, this is a comment on the lawyering involved in that letter that the city paid to have written. For a no further action, you have to have a post-closure plan, a permanent marker, a financial assurance mechanism, provisions for monitoring operation maintenance, and oversight necessary. That letter from your lawyer to the state had none of that. I mean, it was not, it was, there's a checklist for every letter a lawyer writes, and what they put in there wasn't enough, and then they missed basic things that had to be in that no effect letter. And the state just said, no, you can't have the no effect. <laughs> and I couldn't disagree with what the state said, because that's what's supposed to be in this letter. So the city, through their lawyer, wrote back and said, okay, if these sampling points are higher than the levels required, what we're going to do is sink more wells, and we'll do an average for the entire site, and the average will be below. They're not cleaning it up. They're not denying that the stuff is higher than it should be. They're saying we'll sink more wells, and we'll get the average below what it should be, and that should be enough. And for the rest of the things that the state requires, they didn't send that to them. And I would encourage you to ask why. Because this is basic lawyering, and I don't know this firm. I have no connection to this firm. I'm just looking at documents going. If, somebody, if I write to somebody at a patent lawyer, and they say, we need this, this, and this back from you, when I write back to them, I address each point. And even if I don't have what they need, I say, as for point three, I have contacted this person. In two weeks' time, I will have this data, and it will be, I will send it to you right away. But I never ignore what I'm required to give back, because otherwise they reject it out of hand. Well, I don't know, and please forgive me, I don't know who instructed the lawyers to write it this way. We'll, we'll see more wells, and you'll get an average, and then it'll go lower. Um, and then um, the Tri-Media Alternate Monitoring Summer Report, July of 2019, is a god this thick. I couldn't give it to my worst enemy. I mean, 
the nights I read that thing, I was very nasty. But the gist of it is, this is your city and environmental consultant. You, your city Marquette hired these people a long time ago. And this is what they said. Um, they have numerous documents summarizing previous site investigations. I have some of them here. They, the results show the following. Cover of fill materials containing sand, gravel, slate, charcoal, cinders, and concrete debris exist at varying depths. Tar has been identified in discrete small pockets extending several feet below the water table, and that's a critical point because if it's below the water table, it migrates with the water toward the lake. Uh, I won't use the word river, I'm just going to say it migrates toward the wa water with the lake. Retort refinery and tar settling areas. Subsurface tar above or a few feet below the water table is considered to be the probable source of groundwater plume contaminants. In other words, the state is saying you got tar, the tar is the source of the contaminants, and you still, it, your, your own engineers, not the state, your own engineers are saying the tar is still there, it's most likely the source of the contaminants that are causing you to flunk the state requirements. That's from your report. I didn't add or subtract so much as a comma in that statement. Um, what's to be done? Several dissolved phase plume contaminants have exceeded, oh, there's, there's two or three different ways they look at it. GSI is ground, ground surface interface and acute mixing zone. They have all sorts of ways of looking at it. But it, it's still flunking, and that's why I reacted so badly when the, the city representative told the planning commission things were getting better. And I read that in the paper and I went, no, you, you can't honestly say that. One well might be getting better, but no, it's not there. Um, they're going to put in new monitoring points. They're looking at additional nested monitoring well clustered. They put out new wells in June and Ju in July of 2019. That happened just this summer. And then, that's where you're at with your engineers and your lawyers. Where you're at with the business, 2018, the city of Marquette put out a request for qualifications for developers. And that's what they want to build. That's the Viridia Group's proposal. It is, it is preliminary. Everybody knows it's preliminary. They want to put 500 residential units directly on the Cliff Style site. Now, the one thing I want to leave you with is my impression of this as both, well, as an engineer, as a lawyer, a resident of Marquette, and as a human being, knowing what I know about that site, knowing what is still there, knowing the pounding the shoreline is getting and how much we have to fix that to save a major road, the idea of putting 500 residents up there and expecting it to be productive, profitable, and a good thing makes no common sense to me. The one thing about all of this paperwork from the beginning of the city and state involvement with the site is, we're going to do this, we're going to build this, we're going to make this. And then, oh, well, we can't do that because of this. Or we can't do that. Or unexpectedly, or unknown, or uh, we didn't know this was there. That was the tar. And for the northern site, we tested for heavy metals and we're going to put a cap on it. We didn't know they were there. Um, we didn't know they were there is the theme of the city in that site. And that's why um, I'm recommending that the city take a very hard look at taking their elected representatives and talking to both Cleveland Cliffs and the Dow Chemical Company about um, you have a responsibility to the people of Marquette to clean up your mess. When I was with the Dow Chemical Company as a brand new engineer out of Michigan Tech, we were taught product stewardship. That's cradle to grave concern about the products that Dow manufactured. Example, I worked in methicel and some of the methicel we used was used in tobacco leaf wrapping to make cigars. It was a binder. And we had a big discussion one day. We weren't going to sell an industrial grade methicel anymore. They had, to they had to go up to food grade methicel, which is more expensive. But because the cigars went into people's mouths, it touched the person. They wanted to have food grade in the tobacco leaf. That's how serious Dow took it. And that Dow 
I enthusiastically worked for. The Dow that made this mess and walked away after giving the city false positives, for want of a better term, needs to come back and clean up its mess. And CCI needs to come forward and partner to help clean up this mess. This was not the city of Marquette making a bad decision. This was the city of Marquette being misled by the parties in a contract that uh, we're, you know, we're just tired of the whole mess and it's, you know, the, 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 the super fund is all cleaned up, you guys take it and you can make a lot of money from it to where you are now. I, I don't even want to, I almost did a Freedom of Information Act figuring out how much I pay Trimedia. I don't even want to know, it's so big. I, I can't imagine it's under 100 grand a year for the last 10 years. I, and I'm, I'm guessing on that, please don't quote me on that. So that's what they want to do. And the zoning got changed. Um, and the city representative went to the planning commission and said the site contaminants were getting better. And the planning commission voted to approve the zoning change. And the city commission voted to approve the zoning change. And within two days, a representative of the city went to the Brownfield Development Association and said the latest sample showed an uptick in five separate contaminants in that area. So you have a disconnect in your reporting of effects. And it's a real serious one. And it's um, something that I will not stop mentioning. Because we have to, to rely upon the facts. Yes, sir? So is it considered a brown field? Is it like labeled? Is the site right now that you're talking about labeled a brown field? <coughs> Commissioner Schlegel, can you answer that? Because I don't feel comfortable answering on behalf of the city. Yes. Good. Okay. Well, here's what's going to, now, um, unless people go to the Market City Commission and object out loud and in great numbers, which has happened, uh, the development will begin construction and the consequences will be felt by the people, animals, ground and lake ecosystem of Market, Michigan. I was going to say of the entire Great Lakes and Canada because one quarter of the those two countries' economy goes through the Great Lakes. But, um, Here's what I want to leave you with, and I'll stay as long as people have questions. <clears throat> the common sense of putting people on the old Clistow site is not there. There are things that could be done with the old Clistow site. You could make it into an elevated walkway with a parking lot, so people would walk on a walkway above the ground, above the lake, and they could do art and music and pictures, and you could have a bike run up in there. You could have a walkway that people in mo limited mobility could go up and see the lake. You could charge for that and make money. But you don't have people living there. The way I presented this before is go back to the blue tar picture. Think of all the people that have done you dirt in your life, and which one would you recommend walk through that? Uh, it's just, it's, it's, there's no common sense in thinking that residential use of this property is going to yield what you think it's going to yield. Um, there just hasn't been a matchup yet between what's real uh, and what people have been led to believe. And one of the people who saw my thing on Facebook said, we got the old Clistow suggestion box, and I ran over to the house and took a picture of it. I'm getting to be very famous in town. <laughs> I'd like suggestions. I've just given you mine. Uh, number one, delegation talks to their state representative, and they go together to CCI and Dow, and they tell them what's happening, and they say, you have product stewardship obligations, at CCI, you have lived and died on the families of the Marquette Iron Range. You cannot walk away from this. And Dow Chemical, you had product stewardship, and your old guy, the Northern Archives, are critical to this because his paperwork is in there in his own name. Said hardwood, wood tar was harmless. And the city relied upon those statements when they accepted this responsibility. And they're going to give you statute limitations and, you know, so long, so up. And you're going to share with them that the reputation of a company for how, if it's good to do business, is as important as doing business. Number two, I asked for a representative of the developer to come here. 
Uh, they didn't show up. I don't know if they know all of this. I doubt that they do. Um, it's different when you're rehabbing the bunny bread into a nice little area of offices and hotels. And I'm not being funny when I say, well, they had a leaking roof there and pigeons were in the building. And that was difficult. This is astronomically difficult. And whatever you're thinking of Brownfield, the state representative, Steve Harrington, estimates he can't imagine anybody wanting to rehab that property for residential. 10 to 12 million is a low number. I can tell you, going through the paperwork, every time a number's been given for rehab, their actual cost has been two to five times as high. It has never been less, and every time they go to do something, they find a worse problem. So my advice to you is go to the commission meetings and share your concerns. That's what commission meetings are for. My advice to the re elected representatives are I got a book offline last week on Air, uh, Amazon about a gal from the Flint area writing about the Flint water crisis. And I can't read it more than a chapter at a time because I start to cry. Because there's a whole generation of children that are already showing developmental issues. I don't want to, in 15 years, write a book about Marquette, Michigan, talking about the destruction of that part of Marquette based on the decisions that are made now, because that part is the gateway of the island, which cannot, is the soul of Marquette, is the island. So um, it's 8 o'clock. Thank you for listening. I will be here as long as you have questions. I got tons more paperwork. If any of you, um, there's a narrative. I'm, I'm trying to think of the most valuable paperwork um, for anybody to see. The letters. Oh, here's the letter from. Me. Go ahead. Um. <laughs> well, here's the one where, where Jenner's talks about wood tar not being harmful. This is the NMU archive stuff. It's all you've got to do is pay the copying fee to get your hands on this. It's, he left all of his papers there. Yes, sir. I've been on similar sites, you know, that have this kind of situation. Uh, have they been successfully remediated? I can't. And if so, how? I can't find any example. And Commissioner Stonos gave me a really dirty look the last time I was at a commission meeting when I said, I have looked and looked for a location that had charcoal manufacturing that rehabbed it into residential. I, I mean, he's, he's got a lot of Brownfield experience. They've done a lot of work with a lot of different sites. But wood tar is a unique animal that has multiple components and it stays. It does not. I mean, if you poured um, sulfuric acid into Lake Superior, there was a fish in the area really bad. But within five minutes, it would have been diluted down and rushed away. If you drop wood tar into, into Lake Superior, you're talking 50 years at, at the best. So what you're saying, we don't know a successful remediation? I can't, find, I can't find evidence of a successful remediation. What they did with the stuff, the Superfund people, they trucked it to Utah and put it in a dry desert location and put it into a hazardous waste dump in Utah. And that's good. I mean, that place is, doesn't have a lot of water, not a lot of migration, and should stay put. But where it is now, it's in the most valuable location, right next to the most valuable lake in the world, and the water's coming for it. And when it does, um, well, I really want them to build that road, and I really want them to armor the beach. Because if we don't, there's going to be more of the, especially I'm worried, as much as I'm worried about the wood tar, those heavy metals under northern are going to migrate too. It, I'm sorry, but those heavy metals, they're just really nasty stuff. This is what happens when you're a chemical engineer, and you learn all this stuff in theory, and then you come back to your hometown, and you read it, and you think, Oh my, we really can't do this cheap and easy and with a wave of our hand. We really need to dig into this. And I bless you for coming out tonight to listen. And Sally Davis in the corner, one of my all-time favorite people, this is the second time she's had to sit through this, 
And these nice people have heard it three times, plus they heard the pre. <laughs> and I'll be, I'll be saying it again. I'll be offering it again. And I've got an FOIA out as well. But when you go home and talk to Northern, somebody at Northern's got to put up those signs because <laughs> if you find out it's in the deed requirement that there be signs there. I'm not going to do anything about Northern, but somebody's going to fuss about it. Yes, sir. Do they know how much heavy metals lies beneath the Northern property? It was part of the original sale in 99. It was part of the original sale documents in 99. Does the current management of Northern know about it? Is there anyone here from the current management of Northern? I've been emailing and emailing and... Are they monitoring it at all? I don't know. Um, I, yes, there's some chemistry department professors that are aware of the pollutants in the soccer field specifically because of regards to the school and whatnot, but they're not like seeking to remediate, like the chemistry professors, that's how like I'm aware of this or anything like that. And so obviously they're interested in it for the research purposes for remediating the area and whatnot and so um but there's nothing like going on like northern needs to take a look at those the deed was very clear that there had to be signage and that's why i put it in the presentation because somebody uh, cody i know you're not student leader anymore you're good um this needs to be brought to the attention of northern management because it it has to do with failure to warn and by the way, the liability of Marquette right now is bad. Once you build on that and people come on there and have a problem, and they find out they're building on a site next to a former Superfund site, the legal theory they're going to go after you on is failure to warn. For example, if the developer in the deed says, you are living in a property that was right next to a Superfund site, well, they've been warned. He's not going to say that. And if the city doesn't tell everybody who buys there, you're right next to a Superfund site, it's failure to warn. And by the way, failure to warn is how the plaintiffs in the uh, Agent Orange litigation held the chemical companies guilty for uh, failure to warn the families of the servicemen who came back from Vietnam with ailments associated with Agent Orange. My t torts professor at the University of Michigan, Aaron Tursky, as soon as he found out I worked for the Dow Chemical Company, he absolutely loved to tell that story. Mm -hmm. Just look me right in the eye, and I'm like, I didn't work on Agent Orange, but thank you for <laughs> making me responsible for it. But failure to warn is a really big thing. It's a big thing. <clears throat> and when they ran into issues in Founders Landing, they put down six more feet of fill and built Founders Landing, but they didn't test the water. There's no record of them testing the water and what was migrating into the water there. But they didn't have wood tar at Founders Landing. They had petrochemicals which have much less viscosity and migrate better. My, my grandfather built those tanks, by the way. And anybody can tell you once you build a tank, it's going to leak. I'm not being funny about that. I'm just saying um, Fowler's Landing is different. The wood tar is a swear word. It's a swear word of horribleness. So I thank you all for coming. Is there any question I haven't answered? I, have I spoken too much? Too li did I meet your expectation? Did I, Andrew, did I? Okay, okay. Did, what was the most surprise? Um, what was the biggest surprise to you, sir? That there was like multiple kinds of contaminants, just like uh, the tar, the wood, and uh, the, the minerals as yes. well, the lead. The, the nasties yeah, of the, the nasties. nasties, of the nasties. Off the record, uh, and I've told this story in the commission chamber, so I guess it's not off the record. When I was brand new at Gal, uh, mm -hmm. people would say, where are you from? Oh, Market, Michigan. And they would take me aside and say, you, you don't go near that cliff stop site. I said, nobody goes near that cliff stop site. It's been abandoned. They said, well, you don't go near it because that's where we dump stuff. I said, what are you talking about? He said, Midland was closer to Lansing, which meant it had more government attention. And when they had really nasty stuff in Midland, small quantities that they didn't want to report to the state. Uh, the guy coming up from Midland had a jacket and he put the bottle in his jacket. It was a special jacket. He went to the Dow Chemical site, walked around, he said, oh, I'm going to check something out, found a corner and poured the stuff out. And the snow came and covered it up. Now, the three people who told me the story, two of them are dead. I only remember the name, the first name of one of them. But that's another reason why I'm concerned. Yes, sir? I, I know you're not a health expert or anything, but have you seen or have any idea what health-wise what being exposed to some of these chemicals would do to someone? One gram of phenol, 
was used as an executioner's dosage in, in modern times, one gram. That's a concentrated gram of phenol. Now, the state sets guidelines for each of these chemicals based on acceptable tolerances, because you can never have nothing. But what I'm saying is, when I say these are nasty chemicals, this isn't like 20 cans of old paint or like 500 tires, which are really bad, and the Superior Watershed Partnership cleaned it up. These are things you don't want in water, especially not in that water. And I'm talking too much. I don't have the magical answer, but I think it's time to go to CCI and Dow. I think it's time to go to the Northern Archives and find those papers from Jenner. He was, he was that guy, and he said wood tar was harmless, and it's not. And they have to stand behind their products. Otherwise, products, they violate their own product stewardship rules. Yes, ma'am. So I'm um, getting a little nervous about the water that we're drinking now. So the, we're contaminating the water, and then you know every, the city says it's OK to drink the water. So is the treatment plant, because you're a professor, is the treatment <laughs> plan plant <laughs> Doing the water well? Water, so every year the drink. city posts a water quality analysis looking for known contaminants. Every year the Marquette Water passes that. The head of the water uh, advisory board is Kurt Goodman, and you can reach him at any time to ask this question. I'm on the wastewater advisory board, so I'm kind of in a conflict here. I don't feel comfortable answering your question in this meeting, which is about the history. But in general, uh, the way the water that people have drunk here is always tested for contaminants. <coughs> I don't. I don't think that's an answer that satisfies you. But uh, one more thing. Let, let me take you back on that. Then, does the site that we're talking about here tonight impact the, the wastewater treatment plant in any of the water in any way, shape, or form? The water that's coming out of our faucet. Kurt Goodman has to answer that one. I don't know the answer to it. I mean, I don't know that if. At one time, when I was a kid, my dad came back from a tour, and he had been told by someone in the city that the treatment plant was still adding a chemical to counteract some of the chemicals from Cliff's Dow. That's an anecdote from 45 years ago. I don't know what they're doing now, and I'm not lying about it. One of the things I raised was the issue is there dioxin on the site, because dioxin is a natural byproduct of combustion processes. And the city representative reported for the Planning Commission there was no dioxin. I double-checked with Steve Harrington, and I said, have you got results for dioxin testing there? And Steve Harrington wrote me an email after about a month. He said, I've checked. I have no record that we've ever tested for dioxin on that site. Dioxin is a contaminant in Agent Orange that caused the problem. So I'm, I'm, I'm not dodging your question. I'm simply not the right person to answer it, because I don't have the historical knowledge that you need to answer that. Yes, sir. Um. A little, you asked about what concerned me. Drilling more wells to bring the average below, you know, the acceptable level. Average is the one statistic that always scares the heck out of me. And a simple example is if 10 people are sitting at a bar and they, they're drinking, and each one of them makes $35,000 a year, the average income is $35,000 a year. Yes. Bill Gates comes and sits on stool number 11, and now those 11 guys' averages are now $95 million a year. Average scares me. So uh, I would suggest anybody with political connections to run away from average and look at the deeper statistics to find out what the problem really is. The city's lawyers wrote that letter. I don't know who instructed that. I don't know. I know this, this I, I guess, the, the mining journal, my dad used to write for the mining journal. I grew up, read every page of it, trying to figure out what he wrote. This headline says, City May Market Cliff Style Parcel, dated 2013. This subheading, subheading here, Berry Tar May Be Emerging Near Occupied Apartments. Common sense. Okay? Common sense. And whatever... Um, I don't know how to say this. We have to stop the erosion of the shoreline for a lot of reasons. And a big reason is we have to stop everything that's in that site from just going into the lake. Because there's going to be consequences there far beyond what we can imagine. 
and the wood tar coming up from the ground, it's happened once, it can happen again. There was no comprehensive cleanup when that happened. They, they, did, they admitted they didn't have any maps, they worked on a grid, they looked where it wasn't, they finally found where it was, they cleaned that up and got out. And they're not mitigating what they did, I'm just saying for the union people, and the representative of the union people, there's page after page and page of, their, of the health and safety requirements for the workers working near that material. I myself had my whole life changed by an overexposure to xylene when I was in my 20s. I inhaled too much of it. I was cleaning up a spill. A gallon of it had spilled on an experiment I was working. And because of that, some 50 years later, I can't be around anything with a smell, anything that has a perfume smell. Ask my hairdresser how much fun it is. Oh, just a little moose. No, you're trying to kill me. I'm serious. I had to get out of the lab. I had to go to law school and become a pad attorney. I couldn't work in the lab anymore after that. So that's my personal exposure scenario. It's not just touching it or eating it. It's breathing it. And when it started with the smell and I'm ending with the smell, I am more afraid of that smell than I am of the water. The water quality is checked for many different things, but I'm more afraid of that smell than you could know. Um, when I was a kid, you know, it was just there. Johnny DiPietro, in one of the newspaper articles, was a former mayor here, he said they used to run their bikes through it, and their moms gave them heck because they got in their clothes and they dragged it inside the house. He said they used to chew on it. They didn't know any better. Well, we know better now. It's up to us to decide um, and I would welcome a follow-up from anybody on this. I'm, I'm available on Facebook. I'm not hiding. I was at a good idea out of town on a business trip next week, but Andrew uh, invited me to the work session, followed by the commission meeting. And uh, I offered to give this presentation to the work session, and the mayor said they were going to listen to uh, their engineer, their law firm, and their engineering firm. And I went, well, all of those people work for you. And I don't. <laughs> Now, everything I said here, aside from the three or four times I held my chest and said that's my opinion, doc document it. If you don't like what I said or you think I exaggerated, challenge me. I will show you the document. Okay? Okay. Well, this went well. <laughs> Nobody ran from the door. I was afraid when you open up the tea bag, somebody's going to run from the door. <coughs>